All right, Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to read verses 1 through 23. Verses 1 through 23, and if you are able, if you would stand. (coughs) Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you have also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, for the praise of his glory. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you, while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let's pray together. Father, uh, as we endeavor this morning to understand, or this evening rather, to understand your word, Lord, we pray that your spirit would work. Lord, that we wouldn't have my thoughts, but what your word says. Father, we pray for understanding. Lord, we pray for uh, the revelation, as it says here, for us to be able to glory in Christ Jesus more because of this wonderful doctrine that we are here to study this morning, this evening. Father, we thank you that you have given it to us. You have given us your word. Lord, that we may know you truly and we may understand, understand salvation rightly. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So you'll probably understand my comment a little more whenever you understand that uh, the topic that we're talking about is the doctrine of election. The doctrine of election. Nobody shot, nobody amen, so we're still on neutral ground. There you go. Way to be in the service, Jared. So we're here to talk about, uh, not, we don't want our understanding of the doctrine of, the, of, the, of election, by the way. 
we've gone through, and Adam's done a real good job of walking us through not only who God is, what his character is, and his nature, but also what the church is and how the church functions. We did a lot of that on Wednesday night. And here lately, we've been walking through soteriology. The doctrine of salvation. How does salvation work? How does salvation been extended to men? How does how have men been saved? How have men been reconciled to God? And so we touched on this in that endeavor. We had to. You can't get around it, right? You have to touch on it whenever you're talking about the doctrine of salvation. But here, we're going to take a little more of an in-depth look, and excuse me if I go way too fast because I have a lot of stuff. But there are a few requirements that I want to presuppose all this with. You will not understand. You will not get it. You will not like it. Unless you have, first of all, a high view of Scripture. A high view of Scripture. Like it's the Word of God. If you do not have that, you won't like what this says. Secondly, you have to have, from that high view of Scripture, a high view of the God who has given it to us. So that presupposes everything we say here today. A high view of Scripture and a high view of who God is. The sovereignty of God. Because we're going to use those words a lot. The sovereignty of God. I want us to talk about, first of all, the high view of Scripture. Psalm 119 tells us, The sum of your word is... Anyone finish it? Truth. The sum of your word is truth. So when we say that we're looking for the truths of the Scripture, we don't go outside of the Scripture to look for the truths. We don't read our philosophies, our way of living into the Scripture in order to make those truths real. We simply go to the Scripture, see what the Word says, and it says God's Word is truth. Uh, John chapter 17, in Jesus' high priestly prayer, uh, prays for the disciples, says, sanctify them, In the truth, your word is truth. Not only is the word the foundation for our faith, it is the sanctifying content for how we are continue and live. It is the way the Spirit works through us. We don't receive Christ, close our Bibles, and walk back out into the world and say, all right, Lord, make us better, and not even open the word. Because we're going to be in Ephesians a lot, but I want us to, to, to kind of know a few things about Ephesians before we get started in it. But one, uh, two words that we're going to use, indicatives and imperatives. Indicatives and imperatives, okay? We're going to, that splits Ephesians right down the middle, by the way. First three chapters of indicatives, last three of an imperatives. Here's what they things are, and so then here's what you do. All right? Romans, Romans uh, splits it after chapter 11. First 11 chapters is Paul's theology about what he believes about everything. All right? The most uh, comprehensive work probably in any epistle. The last three cha- or last five chapters, rather. Our imperatives. How then must we live in light of what he has taught us about Christ? And that's what we're here doing as a church, right? We say we have come to Christ by faith, and we need to understand from that, how then must we live? How then must we uh, work? How then must we exist in this body, in this time, in this place? And what we're studying right now as a church is how then must we govern ourselves? That's what we're looking at in Constitution, the thing. How must we then function? I'm going to read you a couple of quotes. The first, they're actually both from Charles Spurgeon. Uh, The first one, whatever may be said about the doctrine of election, it is written in the word of God as with an iron pen. And there is no getting rid of it. It is written within the word of God as with an iron pen. There is no getting rid of it. So secondly here, we have to have a high view of God. 
So we have the authority of the word. And what we spent a tremendous amount of time on, actually over what's kind of crazy to think of in the last year, was the nature of who God is. We actually started that before August, whenever we were going through the Behold Your God study, looking at the nature and the reality of who God is. A lot of us were there for that, not everyone, but a lot of us were. And that's the most foundational thing we need to understand. Who God is and who we are in light of who God is. So quite a humbling experience. You must have that high view of God. Isaiah chapter 46 says, Declaring the end from the beginning, I will accomplish all my good pleasure. All my good pleasure. Who will change the plans of God? The government? No. You? No. Psalm 111 says about the people of God, says, Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. So it is worth our life's ambition, our time here on this earth, to know who God is. To know who God is. Now, I don't want us to to dive off um, into the weeds just yet. But I, I want to lay kind of this out for you, how, it's, how I have it structured here. Uh, first of all, we're looking at the requirements of beginning to understand the doctrine of election. That's where we just work. We want to, we want to have that, that high view of God. We want to have that high view of Scripture, right? Without those two things, you'll dismiss one of them and just walk out the door. We live in a culture that's kind of done that already. A lot of us, uh, well, I won't share that illustration. Yet. We'll get it later. But... That we live in a culture that has, in a lot of ways, manufactured their own God by abasing him uh, to the will of men. This quote from Spurgeon, I believe the doctrine of election because I am quite sure that if God had not chosen me, I should never have chosen him. And I am sure he chose me before I was born or else he never would have chosen me afterwards. And he must have elected me for reasons unknown to me, for I never could find any reason in myself why he should have looked upon me with special love. It's really kind of a humbling thought. Spurgeon did a lot of thinking about the doctrine of election. Secondly here, uh, in coming off of that, we're going to look at the facts of election. Right? There's, there's got to be facts. Without facts, we don't have a doctrine. You know, without the facts of Scripture, we have nothing to build upon except our own inferences and things like that, which is basically what philosophy is. So let's start off, and you have your Bibles open in the book of Ephesians. We're going to be in chapter 1, and we're not going to go very far into it. Uh, verses 3 through 5, really, is as far as we're going to get. Um, because if you've read what I just read a while ago, you understand there's a lot here. A lot here. And I'll tell you one of the, the great things that I appreciate about Josh Bullock is uh, whenever you're going through things like this, and uh, uh, he started that numbering the Trinity thing, you know, go, well, he didn't start it, I'm sure somebody else did. And you go through here and you're going, one, two, one, two, two, three, two, hold on, back up, one, two, one, two. And so it's really important to know who's talking and whom it's talking about because that makes a difference for us later on when we're looking at the doctrine of election. Some people think of the doctrine of election as only, only something in God the Father. It's not. The doctrine of election is not ever seen in this chapter without Christ. Never seen without Christ. All right, setting up Ephesians. Ephesians is written by Paul, as it says. But Ephesians is written from a jail cell. Paul is in what we understand to be his first imprisonment. He's chained to a Roman soldier. And what is really odd about this is he begins this book with what seems to be this outburst of praise and glory for God and Christ Jesus in his work. 
it, it's almost like starting off with a doxology, right? It, it's like he's been thinking about all these things in his mind. They finally set a piece of paper down. The guy shows up to, for him to dictate it to. He's like, listen, I just have to start here. I've been thinking about this the whole time. And he runs through this doctrine here of salvation and of Christ and how Christ has brought us uh, and reconciled us to God. But this is during his first imprisonment. He's chained to a guard. He, he is writing to the people who are in Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is in Asia, right? It's not too far from the coast, but it is part of Asia. And if we remember right, in the book of Acts, he spent a lot of time in Ephesus. A lot of time in Ephesus. There was even an uprising while he was there by the craftsmen that built idols. Remember the, all of them going around shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians, and all these things. And they drag two of the Paul's disciples away, and, and they have this big, the town uh, head guy has to come up and stop them and say, Listen, guys, you're going to get us killed. I mean, I, it's a simple way to put it, but that's what happened. They're like, You have to stop, or the Romans are fixing to say, Hey, you you're aren't worth having around. But also, he is very affectionate towards the elders there. He bypasses them on his way back to Jerusalem, but he does stop at Miletus, and there he calls them here. He's like, I, I need these guys to come here. And he's very affectionate in how he gives them, he tells them he'll never see them again, which is probably a lot of the reason why he's writing the letter, so he can update them on how he, how he is and how he's doing in prison. But he's very affectionate towards them and very, um, um, very pastoral in how he leads them. He tells them that, you know, he's going away. He's never coming back. And you need to stand boldly for the word of God in your place because there will be wolves who come in seeking to devour the sheep. Shepherd the flock of God. That's his exhortation to them. Shepherd the flock of God. So with that kind of all in mind, let's begin with uh, looking at the book of, of Ephesians in chapter 1. First, the first verse, okay? <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. And there we put a hard stop, right? Now we remember Paul's conversion story and how Paul is the only apostle who had not walked with the Lord as in pre-resurrection. But Paul is the apostle who has received direct revelation from the Lord post-resurrection, right? Remember, his apostleship was kind of challenged there for a little while, and he had to go up and present his case to the other apostles, and they're verifying, like, okay, okay, you know, your apostle Christ has come to you, and he's given you these things. But he, he starts this off very, specific, very specifically, excuse my, my stuttering, that it is by the will of God, by the will of God, and that's something that we need to have repeating in our minds. By the will of God. Not only was his apostleship by the will of God, we remember his salvation experience was undoubtedly by the will of God. And you're wondering, like, why can't God do that to my brother? And, you know, just knock him down, put some scales on his eyes, send somebody to preach him the gospel. He believes they fall off. You know, hunky-dory. But there's no doubt in Paul's situation here that he is bound to the will of God right now. He calls himself a prisoner for Christ. He is bound to the will of God. He has nothing to do with his own outcome. Remember, he's chained to these Praetorian Guard members. He, he is, uh, as one theologian put it, with the Navy SEALs of the Roman Empire. He is under house arrest. Remember, these are the guards for Caesar's household. He has absolutely nothing he can do other than talk. And in this letter, he also says, Pray for me that I may speak boldly. All right? 
That's later on in the imperatives. These, we're, we're dealing with the indicatives right now. By the will of God also means we should not, we should not make God palatable. When I say by the will of God, I don't mean that because you two have agreed on something. I don't mean that you've come to a resolution. I don't mean that you've bartered or traded. By the will of God means that his will surpasses yours and there you are. By the will of God. We don't qualify God or we don't make God palatable. All right, so, so let's look a little further down. So we're, we're going to reread. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints, it's also important, to the saints who are at Ephesus, who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we have two members of the Trinity right there. God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. This is kind of setting us up for what I was talking about earlier. In Christ, just as he chose us, in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. Full stop. Now, those are very few words with a very, very, very deep meaning. If a lot of you grew up like I did and I think from our conversations, most of you have, in the uh, Baptist culture of southern Arkansas, we know that we are not allowed to read that verse. That will get you removed from being over the Sunday school class in a heartbeat. We know that we do not make reference to Romans 8.28 through 9.24. Because those arguments simply cannot be refuted with the VBS material that we currently buy. Because of these words. That he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. That he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now we're, we're going to kind of break down that phrase a little bit. What does it mean to be chosen? What does it mean to be chosen? Now we want biblical definitions, not our own. This is not picking a softball team, right? I'll take Jimmy, you take you know, Lyle and work our way down through the other people who aren't good at playing softball. This is not God doing that. He's not looking for skill. He's not looking for attractiveness. We can go ahead and say God's not looking for you to be useful at all. There, there's nothing that you can offer God. There's nothing that you can give him. There's nothing that you can say, Lord, I'd be really good on this part of the thing. Or I'd make a good preacher, I think. Um, no. God needs nothing from you. Nothing. He is complete in and of himself. He needs nothing. What we're looking at is acts of grace. So chosen. He's not, and this is part of the refutation for the, the, the world we live in, so just hold on to it. God is not looking through the corridors of time. He's not your Friday night football coach with a game reel, fast forwarding and rewinding, looking to see what plays that you're going to run later, how you react when certain situations, and trying to do a write up on you like a scouting report. So the trouble is, God can know those things, but God doesn't know those things because He looked into them, it's because He's written them.
To say that there's some type of reality of time outside of God is almost blasphemy. <clears throat> to say that there's something that God can fast forward and rewind, we really have to think about how we use that kind of language whenever we talk about God because we almost separate some things. We can't separate God from his creation. You can't do that. You have no creation then. Remember, God sustains all things. God is the one who holds all things together. In him we live, move, and have our being. So chosen in God is not that we have anything to offer. Chosen in God is not that he has seen that we'll say yes, so it's an easy mark. Chosen in God means that our purpose in Christ presupposes our being. That God has purpose for us, not that we have something for God. There's nothing outside of the work of God. Um, if we flip over and if, if I lose you, just hit me up at the end. We'll talk about this stuff all night. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. All right? Salvation by faith, not works. We love that, right? Verse 10 is where it gets complicated. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. God is a chosen people and a chosen path for that people. And a chosen purpose for that people. Right? Secondly, we have two words in Him. This is where we have to identify Trinity rightly. Right? So let's look. Verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we will be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. Now, I, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I almost see a pattern there. He chose us in him, right? He chose us in in him before the foundation of the world that we be, we be holy and, plain, and blameless before him. And then we have it again. In love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. He chose us in him, I would argue, means we chose us in Christ. In Christ. Not outside of Christ, not because of Christ. He chose us in Christ. And you think John, he... He had to have this in mind when he's writing John 1, 1, right, by the way. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And all things were made by Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. He sees it. He sees all purposes in this world being culminated in the cross, flowing down through the gospel, that these people have been chosen in Christ. In Christ. There is no election outside of Christ Jesus. It's as essential as the will of God the Father. Father, It is the work of the Son. 
as essential as the will of, the God, of God the Father, is the work of the Son. I think a lot about Old Testament covenants and how weird they are. You take and cut something in half, you put the dead pieces on either side, and you walk through the middle, and that's you making a covenant, right? It's kind of strange for us. We're thinking you get a notary, you sign a piece of paper, and that covers it. But no, they, they, they would take a life, right? With the understanding that if you violate that covenant, blood was spilt in vain, therefore your blood should be spilt. Think about the work of God in Christ Jesus on the cross. And the spilling of the blood. What we call the new covenant. Our, that covenant is in his blood. You are not of the elect of the Father without the atoning work of the Son. I want to kind of remind us a little bit of John chapter 6. 10 and 17. So I say John, he was he was in on it. Paul probably writes this letter, he hears about it, he's like, yes, brother, yes. We see how the ones that belong to the Father are given to the Son, and he will lose none of them. None of them. We have to remember who Christ is. He is God. He is the Son in the Trinity. But He is God. He is no less God than God the Father. He has the fullness of God dwelling within Him. And all that the Father has given Him, He will hold on to and the work will be accomplished. Christ leaves himself no margin for error. It's not most. All. It's not maybe. It's definite. All who has, the Father has given me, I will keep them. When? The win of election. This is actually a debate among theologians, believe it or not. I don't know. There's a lot of people out there smarter than me when it has to do with this, but I fall in the, the camp of supralapsarianism. We'll explain that later. I had to look up how to spell it. But this phrase, before the foundation of the world, For the foundation of the world. This really hit me hard. I have to go back and, and you have to restudy and re remember things that you've forgotten. The redeeming work of Christ. The redeeming work of Christ on behalf of those whom God has chosen precedes light. Precedes light. Does that not give that depth? Before the foundations of the world. Light was made with the presupposition and the foreordained purposes of God as a mean by which those, as a means by which those who were his would see and know that there is a God, and he has done all things well. The earth, a place prepared for the people of God, was prepared with God having in mind the utterance of the words, take the earth and subdue it.
here's where it gets interesting. Even the fall. As a purposed and planned event that the Son of Man might be raised up and demonstrate the grace and mercies of God. That we might cry out, just as the Apostle Paul has in Romans 11, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable fathomable are His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? And who can become his counselor? Think about that. That that is the hinge pin on which the book of Romans turns, by the way. I firmly believe that. That that is the climax. That is it. The depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. It should give us comfort as Christians and assurance that you are not living in God's plan B. That he did not have to regather himself and rework things out after Adam eats the fruit and disobeys and sin comes into the world and death because of sin. Then we see the atoning work of the animal that God shed its blood in order to cover the human beings who have transgressed against him the foreshadowing of the work and the purposes of Christ Jesus' ministry on this earth. It's amazing when you pull at a thread how you see one move in the very beginning when you pull at one in Ephesians. <clears throat> this is the doctrine of election. And it's really easy for me to get excited about it. Not only that, we have election, and it's always thrown in with what? Predestination. Those are, those are packaged together, or they were my whole life. Whenever someone believed in election, they automatically, automatically believed in predestination. And then you have to say, amen, somebody, as Vody Balkum would say. God... Is not biting his nails today. Wondering what's going to happen tomorrow. With these loose cannon Christians. And heathens of human beings walking around on this earth. See predestination. He predestined us to adoption as sons. Through Jesus Christ to himself. This is God's providential work. Remember we talked about in Romans chapter 8. We went through the order of salutis, right? We have regeneration. We have justification. We, we have sanctification. We have adoption. We have glorification. And we went through all that. How that works within the context of salvation. And we see God's providential work. And if you are in Christ today, it is not because you happened upon something. It is because God prepared beforehand for you to hear the gospel of your salvation and for the Spirit of God to work in you in such a way to bring you to himself by faith. That's it. There's no credit given to the one who shared it. There's no credit given to the one who obeyed it. It is the sovereign work of God. And it is glorious to live it out. It's glorious. It's God's gospel call to our lives. It's God's spirit that works in our lives. And it is God's family identity that we have been adopted into. We have become as the mission. And by the way, another theme of the book of Ephesians, another really good word for you to watch whenever you're reading it, is the word mystery. It's in there often. For good reason. That this book speaks of really high things. Really lofty ideas. And really puts God in his rightful place as the sovereign God of the universe. But we have become co-heirs with Christ. 
by receiving adoption as sons through the death, burial, and resurrection and shed blood and the atoning work of Jesus Christ. From death to life. Something we talked about in Ephesians chapter 2. And that's what a lot of the memes that Calvinists use, and that's another word you'll hear, by the way, it triggers some people. You have to be careful with it. The question is, what can a dead man do? If Romans chapter 1 is, is speaking the truth of our condition, that we are dead in trespasses and sin, Ephesians 2 reiterates it, for you were dead in trespasses and sin. What can a dead man do? I was uh, uh, listening to Sinfer Sinclair Ferguson on this one time, and he's, he's going through, and he said, people like to bring up, said, oh, you're one of those that, you know, likes predestination and election. He said, what do you do about Christ standing at the door and knocking? He said, I tell the truth that the, whoever's on the inside is dead on the table. There has to be a sovereign work of God in the life of the person hearing the gospel to regenerate their heart and call them the newness of life. That's the beauty of Ezekiel 37, right? I, I love his response, by the way. He's so honest. Son of man, can these bones live? Lord, you know. Young man going out and doing evangelism. Can these bones live? The Lord knows. He does not count the seeds he gives you. He just tells you to go spread them. Hit everybody with it. If they already know Christ, maybe it'll, it'll restir them in Christ. Can these bones live? And remember Ezekiel spoke the word of the Lord over the bones. And they began to rattle and shake. And bones came together, bone to bone. And then sinews formed and then muscle forms. And then God breathes the breath of life into them. The glorious work of God and salvation. Emphasis on the glorious work of God. The glorious work of God. A dead man can do nothing. So we've walked through a little bit of Ephesians and, and, and the greatness of that. Uh, I, I just want to reread this. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before Him. Don't forget this part. This is very important. In Love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. We cannot forget the love and the kindness of God in doing this. This is not cold and callous. This is not analytical data entry. This is a loving act of a kind and loving father who has drawn a people out for himself. Remember what he told Gideon. Gideon's like, Lord, I don't have anybody to go out and to fight these wars. I have set aside for myself. I have set aside for myself. That's when we talk about the perseverance of the saints. So that is God's word. Our assurance that we have been talking about. That is because we are so assured that God knows exactly what he's doing. And the promises he has given us in Christ Jesus will not fade and will not be overturned. It's God's election. It is His work. I want to walk through with us. You can be turning over to Romans chapter 9 as if you didn't already anticipate that. 
Romans chapter 9. Guys, this, this is, by the way, th- this is not meant to be This is not meant to be cynical in any way towards any other faith, towards even how I was raised, that, that, you know, it is my will, not his. These are simply the truths of the Bible. We want to stay with that. We want to stay with the truths of the Bible. And we're going to begin reading this in Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called, and these whom he called, he also justified, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, this is assurance, by the way, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Full assurance. Nothing. I always want to put emphasis on no other created thing. The only thing that wasn't created is God. All other has flowed out from him. This is his work. This is his assurance, right? And if he says it, there's nothing that can thwart it. Chapter 9, verse 1. I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, My kinsmen, according to the flesh, hang on to that. By the way, people, Paul is not cold to those who don't know Christ. He is afflicted at heart for the lost. He's not cold and indifferent. Who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons, and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law, and the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac... Your descendants will be named. And it's important here for us to to note. Isaac was not an only child. Nor was he the first child. It was was not Abraham's first son. was not his only son. But through Isaac, your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God. That the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also. When she had conceived twins by the one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born, and had not done anything good or bad, 
so that God's purpose, according to his choice, would, be, would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, and he quotes Malachi here, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. That's why I wanted us to start off with the understanding that we have to have a high view of Scripture and a high view of God. Our understanding for anything else has to flow from those. May it never be. This is the most emphatic no ever. We could think of all type of explicits to put with it. May it never be. Meganoita. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills. Read that again. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Verse 19, you will say to me then, the anticipation builds. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? On the contrary, who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? Stop right there for a minute. Many of us were grown up and we were sold salvation like it was a, con a timeshare condo at Boca Raton, Florida. Uh, agree to the terms, show up every once in a while, and always expect to have a good time. And then we got in the Bible. By God's grace. We got in the Bible and realized that God is the one who justifies. God is the one who saves. God is the one who calls. And God is the one deserving of all the glory. That we did not make good decisions. That we did not weigh out the options correctly. I mean, if anything, a lot, a lot of the times, all we weighed out was heaven or hell. We said, heaven, it's not hot there. We live in the south. That makes sense. But simply wanting heaven for the enjoyment of heaven is not the same as being regenerated in Christ. It's not the same. A dog can pick rice and gravy over rotting meat. We are talking about a sovereign work of God. But I want to be careful. Coming to the knowledge of the doctrine of election is not conversion. is not conversion. We have to be careful with that in our testimonies. We have to be careful with that in our thinking. Coming to a knowledge of the doctrine of election is not conversion. Nor can not knowing the doctrine of election prevent it. It is not salvation by election. It is salvation by grace through faith in Christ Jesus, and then election is something that we learn on the backside. For most of us, anyhow. We have to be careful. But I grew up with the idea, and I'm going through some of the oppositions that I promise I should have took my wife's advice, but I'm almost done. Um, words free will. How many people have heard that? Free will. 
I mean, it, it's common. Come on, it's we hear it all the time. Free will. What is free will? Free will presupposes, the way I understand it, moral neutrality. Free will says I can choose to be good or I can choose to be bad. But it is my choice. Which really tears in away from the scriptures when it comes to the doctrine of total depravity. The free will says I can choose God or I can choose hell. Either way, it's free will. We're very protective of free will in our culture. We don't want anybody messing with our free will. Do not touch my free will. There's some invisible force field around each and every person and it's called free will that God cannot get to them. But my question is, in reading Romans 8 and 9, reading Ephesians 1, whose will do you think trumps the other? God's free will or your supposed free will? Because God is the only one who is truly free and worthy of a will. Ours is bound to something. If we are outside of Christ, it is bound to sin and to death. If we are in Christ, it is bound to Christ. It is no longer my will, it is his. We have to be careful when using these oppositions, when com coming to them, because we want to make sure, we want to make sure that we understand them right. Outside of the work of the Spirit, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, your will is the most damning part of you. Because it is the thing that wants to sin. Now, remember where we stopped in the Scripture. Who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? Let's pick up there. Who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, Why did you make me like this? Will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy. He prepared beforehand for glory even us whom he also called not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. As he says in Hosea, I will call those who are not my people, my people, and those who are not beloved, <coughs> beloved. <coughs> Stop right there for a second. We've heard this over and over, that the potter has the right over the clay. The potter has the right over the clay. But I, I want to be assuring in this, Here's the other opposition that you get. By the way, don't let anyone call you a Calvinist without explaining themselves first. <laughs> because <coughs> that's not helpful. Predestination. When people hear these words, they think predestination, animatron robots. Who are programmed, who walk through the world in a soldier-like fashion, making only right angles, doing only what they've been programming to do, and saying only what they've been programmed to say. That is a hogwash view of God's work in the world and God's work in providence and through the lives of human beings. We are made in the image of God. Thinking, reasoning, living, loving. We're not robots. Prior uh, generations would have said puppets with strings. You only do 
as the string pulls you to. And all these ideas are, are saying that these are things that we do against our own will. That somebody is somehow going to be dragged into heaven against their own will. That they did not sign up for the elect. They won the publisher's clearinghouse because someone put their name in there. They're being dri- dri- uh, drugged backwards into heaven. But also it presupposes the same way that people are being drugged backwards into hell. I promise I'm almost done. But we must dispel those myths with the words of Scripture. Assurance, perseverance, all these are things that reassure us that if we are indeed in Christ and we do believe and we have faith, there's no chance of you going to hell. God has not turned back on his promises. God does not do those things. I want to skip. I have a couple more. One of them is John 3.16. And we can talk about that if you guys want to at some later time. Uh, it's the, the Bible verse of our century. That everyone takes out of context. So be thinking about that and we can talk about it. Last point, the right application of the doctrine of election. I told you about the book of Ephesians. First three chapters, indicatives. This is what salvation is. This is who Christ is. This is what God has done. The last three chapters, imperatives. So then you, commands, how to live, how to work. How to function in the world. God gives indicatives and imperatives. Because of election, you don't get to bypass the imperatives of God. You don't get to overlook the imperatives of Scripture. Or somehow use the doctrine of election to squeeze into some mold that allows for you to take a stoic or a fatalistic view of the world and of life. The stoics say we'll just take it on the chin with a grin that's a part of life and it's going to hurt. No, if you, if you take a lick on the chin, you pray and cry out to God because you've been instructed to do so as the people of God to be constantly in prayer, reaching out to God. The fatalist says whatever happens, happens. Doesn't matter. In a lot of the ways, we, want, we try to take that view when it comes to evangelism. The doctrine of election does not allow for a lazy evangelist who puts a bumper sticker on their car, drives around town once a day, and says, that'll do. It's kind of like Charles Spurgeon said, if I knew who the elect were in all of London, if they had a yellow stripe on their backs, I would run around town raising their coats, looking for that stripe, and if someone wants to jump over my body crying out to them into the depths of hell they will have to do so with me gripping at their knees the reason why we as a church by the way this is not a church of the doctrine of election this is not a church even of the reformed faith this is a church of Jesus Christ do we agree With the doctrines of grace, yes. Do we agree that the scripture teaches them? Do we agree that the scripture teaches the doctrine of election? Absolutely. But it also teaches a lot of other things that we need to know. We cannot abandon the scripture. And we cannot put it aside. Because we like or dislike a certain doctrine. I can remember my battle with the doctrine of election came to when I realized that my argument was no longer with anyone other than the Bible. 
And when you find yourself arguing with Paul, you've lost. Because then you have set aside the authority of the scripture and the right view of God for your own presupposition. Brothers and sisters, we are not to be malleable Christians, blown here and there by every wind of doctrine. The Bible teaches that. It tells us that. We are not to be malleable Christians who are influenced by every other cultic religion that comes around who promises something great, something nice, something good, or even a positive feeling about what you're doing. We are to be those who the only malleability is found whenever we come into contact with the true words of the living God as found within the scriptures. And may they mold us. May they shape us. Nothing else. Nothing else. May they shape our testimonies. May they shape how we live. And may they cause us and may they reiterate to us that every day we must glory in Christ. We must glory in the one who has saved us. By his own power, his own will, and his own blood. Let's pray. Father, forgive me for my shortcomings. <clears throat> Lord, that this doctrine is more great than words can really put into and that human thought can put it in the right place. But Father, help us to glory in the Word, to glory in the Bible, to glory in the things that You have said, the things that You have done. Lord, our complete inability means that you have entered into us and you have done it. If we are indeed in Christ Jesus. Our assurance is that you are God. And you cannot be overthrown. You do not lie. Lord, and you have not failed. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.